Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It is Friday, December 15th, and I am so delighted to bring to you an interview that I conducted with Josh Brown. He is half of the dynamic duo behind the podcast, The Compound and Friends. As I've told you, I'm launching a new YouTube video venture with The Compound, and it's called Jill on Money, powered by The Compound. And all you need to do is go to our website, jillonmoney.com, and we have a link to it. Every Saturday, we will be dropping new video episodes of the program. And it's just a blast to be able to work with people that I really, really like. So what we thought would be interesting, Mark and I thought would be interesting, was for us to present to you my interview with Josh Brown, downtown Josh Brown. You may have seen him on CNBC in the past. And to um, that way, get a little flavor for him and what we're trying to do with this new YouTube video series. In this first part of the interview, uh, Josh and I discuss his background, the compound show that he hosts with Michael Batnick, and you get a real flavor for why I like him so much. So here is the first part of the interview with Josh Brown. Josh Brown. Yes. Jill Schlesinger here. Is this Jill on Money? The Jill on Money experience? This is the Jill on Money experience brought to you by the Compound and Friends. Awesome. Uh, Can I just go back in time? I fell in love with you and Michael less than a year ago. Us too. And so this is like Beshert that we have come together. Yes. And brought these two crazy people into a room together, you and me. Yes. And um, I just, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Like, it's like you're bringing us into your family. So it's the compound and friends, but now I feel it's friends and family. Yeah. So this is the way, that's the way I think of it. Um, You're in the family. You are, so you're very special in, in a multitude of ways, obviously, but in terms of the compound itself, you are the first non Ritholtz Wealth employee to have a show on the Compound Network. So you're almost like it's like a Neil Armstrong thing. Like we're we're te- we're we're seeing I how like this it. goes in real time, and it's very exciting. Okay. So I want to cover the base of like why I actually got involved in this program because I really knew you from a long time ago. You don't even know that. I don't think you realize, but I followed you on Twitter when Twitter was Twitter and it was okay. fun. Before OG it was, Twitter. Yeah. Before it was a cesspool. Yeah. And you once retweeted something I did at CBS Money Watch. Okay. Uh, who could remember when? Right. And I was so excited. I was very tickled because I was like, oh my God. Oh, cool. Downtown Josh Brown. Yeah, yeah. Actually, And so I think what I loved about it is that both you and I trained as investment advisors. Yep. I came from the trading world. You came from the retail sales of the uh, of the investment world. You could world. say boiler room. It's okay. I, wasn't gonna, I don't want to say right. that. Everyone, but to it's, people, out, it's out there. So, we, so we're proud of it. So for people who don't know a little bit of your yeah. backstory, can you explain who you are and how you got to this amazing lofty place? I would, lo- I would love to. So for the Jill on Money audience that uh, is not very familiar with my backstory, I spent the first 10 years of my career selling stocks, mutual funds, closed-end funds. I was like the stereotypical Series 7 registered representative working at a succession of brokerage firms, and our job was to sell products to people. Sometime around 2008, 2009, I don't know what was going on in the I world. I know, it's sort of a small thing. Yeah. Uh, during the great financial crisis, I really was forced to look in the mirror and uh, admit to myself that nothing I had done in that first 10 years was really helping anyone. And I was not really helping myself either. I wasn't particularly successful. I think because I had a conscious, a conscience, not a great thing to have when you're selling commission-based uh, <laughs> financial products. Anyway, I made a decision to reform. That's where the blog uh, title, The Reformed Broker, came from. Uh, it be- kind of became my persona online. I joined Twitter. I started to write my blog. I met some of my uh, idols, including Barry Ritholtz. Fast forward a couple of years, we launched the current firm that we own uh, in 2013. And I am no longer, obviously, a retail stockbroker. Uh, back in 2010, I dropped my Series 7. I am now a Series 65 uh, IAR, Investment Advisor Representative. That's the designation. Mm-hmm. And the firm we manage is a registered investment advisory firm, which means we only get paid for advice. We can't sell any products to anyone. 
and that's the way we like it. And Ritz, Ritholtz has people all over the country, right? It's yeah. like they're not all – they're not, you don't like have employees per se. Yeah, all over the room. Well, I mean, gonna, the- yeah, but, but you have place, people all over the place who are not just – you're not you're a New York-based organization with people all over the place. Yes. So we're a very strange firm. Most registered investment advisory firms, as you know – they're built locally, and if they do well, they expand regionally. Then they become statewide. Then maybe they make an acquisition in a contiguous state, and they grow that way. We grew outside in. We had more clients outside of New York than in New York, and that's because the entire following of the firm was not built at a country club uh, where, where we play golf all day. It was built online. And it was built based on our ideas and our writing and our philosophies. So we're 60-something people at this point. I think we have 25 client-facing certified financial planners. Those are the people who interact with our clients each day and really become a part of their lives. And then we've got this whole incredible run of support folks, client service associates, researchers, uh, subject matter experts in areas like tax, estate planning, insurance, um, we've got a team of traders. We've got a media team, as you can see here. So Jesus, it's been really it's like a lot of overhead, though, man. I, I tell you something. It's a lot of overhead, but uh, it's it's we we nobody told us to do it this way. Yeah. This is what we want. This yeah. is what we wanted to do. That's so. awesome. Yeah, it's pretty and cool. What's interesting to me is that like you are a straightforward, like investment advisor, pretty vanilla when you talk about like advice and what you need to do. However, your show, the yeah. Compound and Friends. I think that um, it was surprising when people might tune into you. First of all, you're so incredibly entertaining, but also you love talking about the economy and investing. I mean, Michael is a CFA, not a CFP. So he has – his brain is wired to like love investing. Yeah. So how do you marry these two sides together? Like, hey, I'm, I'm so kind of like you- the boring advice guy, but I love talking stocks. I'm really glad that you asked that. This is my lane. If you think about the spectrum of market commentators – On the far left, let's say, you have the mad money crowd, day trading, options trading, hedge fund wannabe, like just people that think or or act as though they know everything that's about to happen. They're an expert in every stock under the sun. They're constantly trading. They're always making money. Everything they say is right. That's, I think, traditionally what's dominated financial media, let's say, up until the last 10 years. And th- there's been a sea change, which we can go very in depth, or or we could just uh, gloss over it. But let's say that's one end of the spectrum. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum of financial commentator, and that is very puritanical, uh, very doctrinaire. Anyone who ever deviates in any way from the Vanguard 500 index ETF at three basis points is literally a heretic and should be burned at the stake. <laughs> And I might got, lean that so that way. Okay, you've I'm got, scared. You've got the Bogleheads Forum. <laughs> yeah, you've got uh, you know you've got people who just <gasps> are you actively investing? <laughs> how dare you? How are you unfamiliar with the academic literature on how detrimental it is to actually have an opinion on a stock? Okay, those are the two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I think I'm closer to the more puritanical in terms of what we actually do for clients. However, I think I'm much more interested in the left side of the spectrum, market commentary, price targets, upgrades, downgrades, new technology breakthroughs. That's what I'm really excited about and interested in. I just know better than to think I'm going to dominate that type of market activity. Mm. Of course, I'm not. Yeah. Here's why that's important to our viewers, listeners, fans, readers, subscribers. They feel the same. I think they feel the same way that I do. It's important to know what's going on in the market. And with prolonged exposure to that information, what should happen is you should recognize a pattern. How many people are wrong? How many things people are wrong about? How frequently everyone is wrong? And once you become accustomed to that, you start to realize, okay, the right side is 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 the way to do it. The left side, though, being being exposed to it and understanding it, 
is why I'll be able to stick to the right, right I, side. I love this idea that once you're really immersed in the world of looking at stocks and valuations and all this stuff and ups and downs and like I love when you and, and Michael are, are talking and you're like, well, next 30 days. Yeah. Now, like that appeals to the trader in me. Yeah. But you're right. The more you do well, it. Michael is uh, next 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but the more you do it, the more you do realize like, oh, wait a second. This is nonsense. And I'm not saying nonsense, you can't make money. But um, in when I'm talking to people and they come on the show and they're like, they have a fun money account. Like, I'm cool with that. Like, everyone does. Everyone has a fun money account, yeah. right? So um, I think for me, I do sort of lean towards the indexing and it just makes more sense. And by the way, there's so many more ways to be constructive about building wealth than just investing. I want to say one – I want to say two things. So – we are the type of firm that says what we really believe, and I think people appreciate that. And as a case in point, on Tuesday of this week, my chief operating officer, Nick Majuli, who also writes a very popular blog called Of Dollars and Data, he did a post where he talks about when he was younger, he used to think that his job was to optimize his portfolio perfectly. Mm. And he's, you know, he's laughing at how little money he had, but he was so obsessed with you know how much stocks, how much bonds, how much cash, how much gold – as he grew up, and I've watched him grow up, I've known him for a long time, and he's been he's been here with us for years, he came to understand that's irrelevant. What really matters is raising my income. What really matters is building my career. The asset allocation being optimized or not ain't going to make a difference. Now, how many financial advisory firms would allow an employee to say that out loud? Yeah. Not a lot. Yeah. We have always said things like that out loud. I think people read them and appreciate them. Uh, it's a little bit unorthodox. It's a little bit renegade, but that's what we're that's what we're about. The second thing, if people say like, "Oh my God, you're you, you, how do you expose yourself to this much market commentary and TV and and podcasts? Um, like like how does it not drive you crazy or to or to do crazy things with your investing?" There's a great scene in the Avengers, and the whole movie. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is trying to trigger Mark Ruffalo and like, what's your secret? Like, how are you staying under control and not becoming the Hulk? Yeah. So I think by the end of the movie, Ruffalo says, all right, you want to know my secret? I'm always angry. <laughs> okay. So you want to know my, you want to know my secret, how I don't get triggered to like do crazy things in, yeah. in my, because I'm always around it. I'm, I swim in it. Mm -hmm. So I know better. I know that so much of it is entertainment, infotainment. It's great knowledge to have. It's exciting. But I also know how little of it is really actionable. We'll have part two of my interview with Josh Brown tomorrow. If you would like to check out our new YouTube video content called Jill on Money, powered by the compound, you can just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. We've got a link to it. Or if you're on YouTube, you can just search the compound and we are a separate playlist under the compound. So you can check us out there. Meanwhile, if all this conversation rattles your brain and you've got a financial question, don't hesitate. Just go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. We'll get your note. We'll either read an email. We'll bring you on to do an audio version with us. We'll bring you on the new video show. It's all available to you at the jillonmoney.com website. So just go there. That's where all of our content lives. It's Friday, so we're going to do some business. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer and king of all things web, and we are distributed by Odyssey. In fact, you can subscribe to the Jill on Money show on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Don't forget to leave us a rating and review wherever you listen. Try to lift someone up, change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.